Let's now look at some theories. Uh, flu vaccine, seasonal flu vaccine and swine flu vaccine are protective against swine flu. Pure theory. No evidence for that. I mean, uh, it doesn't mean it's true or not true. It's just a theory. Vitamin D is protective against colds and flu and pneumonia. A theory. And a theory is maybe something you explain things that you see. Um, sun exposure causes skin cancer. A theory. I mean, it's a theory we've gone on for the last 35 years. I mean, there's some flaws to the theory because, as you saw, what, what a theory, in order to become a fact, the evidence has to put in that direction. Um, vitamin D, let's see, uh, you think I can read my own writing? Not a chance. <laughs> uh, even with my bifocal contact lenses, I still have trouble. Uh, well, there's another theory here that, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, that I put down in here, you know. Um, and and so, so now I've got to give you the three words, uh, theory, uh, uh, evidence, and, and fact. And I've got to give you some legal definitions also. What a doctor sees in his or her office is evidence. And, and you know, well, we tend to believe that evidence makes a case. But in law school, they had a great definition for evidence. And they said evidence was like you had a coffin, and your goal was to get that coffin shut so no one could open it up. You know, um, and every bit of evidence was a nail driven into the coffin. And when you had enough nails in the coffin, eventually the coffin stays closed. You know, and, and so that's evidence. But what a doctor sees in his or her office is evidence. It's a nail. And, and doctor after doctor has seen things uh, that are indisputable. And I, I hate using those words because as lawyers say, relatively indisputable, virtually indisputable. I always put an adjective in front of there, you know. Uh, um, all right, so, so now, now we got there. Let, let's go on to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, because, uh, and by the way, life extension, which I have nothing to do with, uh, and I, I wrote this uh, lecture about a year ago, and they did, a, they did a better job than me. If you go to page 74, it's actually better than what you're going to hear uh, today on swine, flu vac on swine flu vaccine, protective flu, and vitamin D. So let, let's go on, you know. Uh, Okay, there's a, a picture of the sun. Oh, I think there's a pointer here I can use too. The sun, <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the number one source of, of vitamin D. Unfortunately, we got a problem, you know, uh, uh, um, none of us are in the sun very much. In fact, I have dear friends in California who when I tell them, let's get a vitamin D measurement, which I'm sure everyone in this room has done with virtually every one of your patients. Come on, Mayor, what do I need that? I live in Southern California. Well, we, I start running vitamin D levels on my friends in Southern California, 19, 22, 24. I mean, these are borderline rickets, you know, uh, and all of them are suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome. They're all suffering from a seasonal affective disorder. I mean, the, and, and, you know, and, and I say, well, let me ask you, uh, Stan, one of my good friends, um, what time do you get up in the morning? Six o'clock. What do you do? I go running for half an hour. That's good. What do you do? I get a shower. I eat breakfast. What do you do then? I go to work. Uh, what do you do next? Well, I get home about five or six o'clock. I said, how often are you in the sun for at least 15 or 20 minutes uh, during the midday sun? Zero. And when he saw his numbers, he just uh, was aghast at that, you know. See what comes next. No, that's the point here. Let's try this one. Uh, and, and here's a, a study from the Archives of Internal Medicine, April 2009, and it just really essentially shows that uh, I want to take from the so-called, quote, peer-reviewed accepted literature. I'm not going to any of the hippie alternative medicine stuff. It's most probably better, but at least they, they're, we're getting some recognition. In the, um, and take a look at this statement here. A decade later, just 23% of the 13,000 surveyed had at least that amount. And we're talking about 30 nanograms. Now, I can tell you 30 nanograms is a joke, as all of you know. I mean, that's a pathetically low amount. Uh, uh, but that's even better than it was five years ago when they talked about 22 and 23 uh, nanograms as being an acceptable level for vitamin D. Children need 10 times more vitamin D, and, and this is already July 2008, and the American Academy of Pharmaceuticals, oh, I'm sorry, the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, they, um, uh, they doubled the amount children should get. This is like someone dying in the desert from uh, dehydration, 
And instead of giving them one ounce of water, you give them two ounces of water and say, you're right. Or 10 ounces, and they're dying from dehydration, you know. Uh, and this is a study just showing that, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Fulihan, uh, he, he felt that 2,000 a day is not only safe for adolescents, but is actually necessary. I want you to know where I've learned more than anything else. And it's one of the reasons why I come to the A4M conference, uh, not only as a speaker, but also as a listener to many of the lectures, and also to talk to doctors in the hallway, because I like to see what doctors are actually doing in their office. And I want to give you two or three vitamin D, which, by the way, has been, in my mind, one of the most awesome some this rediscoveries I can think of in my practice. I put it right after home birth, breastfeeding, uh, questioning vaccines. Uh, I put uh, uh, bioidentical hormones, and then I put vitamin D. And I, vitamin D actually may be higher than a couple of the other uh, uh, um, uh, factors. Uh, and, and what I've learned here is whatever we're doing with our patients, many doctors here are doing more. For example, two years ago, the average doctor was uh, uh, giving 1,000 units of vitamin D3 to their patients. They were taking 2,000. A year ago, they were taking between three, uh, they were giving their patients three to 4,000, and they were taking 5,000. And last summer, many doctors were taking 10,000, and their patients were at 5,000. So it's interesting. There's a little bit of lag. I love it. I love the idea of doctors. I don't want to use experimenting on themselves, but playing around with the numbers. And, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, but the real answer is these are all guesstimates, because the goal is to get the blood level above 60 to 80, which seems to be the operative numbers for protection against so many things.